So, so this gives us sort of a benchmark for what we might look for. The, this distribution of dark matter in the sky that I mentioned earlier, a lot of non, a lot of matter that isn't dark matter, which can affect the results of the simulations. When I talk about the dark matter, the estimated dark matter density in this talk, I'm going to use this functional form to approximate the dark matter density as one moves towards the center. Here, R is distance from the galactic center. RS is a scale radius, which is about 20 kiloparsecs for the Milky Way. So this corresponds to a density that falls roughly as 1 over R cubed at large radii, which matches the rotation curves. At small radii, we're essentially just modeling the dark matter density as a power law with an unknown power. Okay. Because the reason for this is that in the classic models of dark matter density based on the simulations, this gamma power is about 1. But once we add baryons to it, we don't actually know where, even whether this number goes up or down reliably. So this cap, so we expect we have some expectation that the dark matter density could rise in towards the galactic center and that the distribution should be approximately, should be roughly spherical, at least more spherical than the gas is. But we don't um, we don't really know how fast it should rise. I'm just mentioning this equation now because I'm going to talk later about power law slopes for the signal as we move into the center, and I'll be referencing in terms of this number count. Okay, so that's sort of what we might look for in a dark matter signal. So let me tell you about the excess which we actually see. So everything, all the data that I show you here is data from the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. This instrument was launched in 2008. It's in low Earth orbit. It's a gamma ray telescope that's sensitive to gamma rays from tens of MeV up to several TeV and potentially higher energies, but it runs out of statistics um, above a few TeV. It's a full sky instrument. It's, um, it scans the entire sky every two orbits. It rocks back and forth about the orbit. Uh, one orbit is 90 minutes. And it's been taking data for more than seven years now, and all that data is public. It's updated and online every week. So I'm not a member of the experimental collaboration. I'm not a member of the Fermi collaboration. This is all work done purely using the public data set. All right, so the GED gamma ray axis. This slide is basically what you need to know about it. I will show pictures on subsequent slides which illustrate these points. The GED gamma ray excess is an apparent excess of gamma rays of energy about 1 to 3 GeV in the central region of the Milky Way. It's spatially concentrated at the galactic center but it extends out, as far as we can tell, it extends out to at least 10 degrees from the galactic center, which corresponds to about 1.5 kiloparsecs. It was first discovered in the galactic center by Gunnar Cooper in 2009. So the Fermi data became public in, I think, September 2009, and this paper came out in either October or November 2009. So it was very fast. The reason it was so fast was that this signal is, act is not particularly small. At the peak energy of the excess, this one to three G, these one to three GeV energies, it's about a third of the photons coming from close to the galactic center. And the latest data sets, the number of photons attributed to this excess is in the tens of thousands. So this, I mean, you, you could say, I'll give you an argument on the next couple of slides, it's not just a mismodeling of known backgrounds, but um, what it's definitely not is a statistic is just a statistical fluctuation of the models. This is ridiculously statistically significant. The question is systematics. What is it an excess compared to? Okay, good. <laughs> it's an excess... No. Okay, good. So it's an excess compared to, model, compared to models of the gamma ray emission in the region. The fact that there is some excess in the data relative to the gamma ray models in the region would not in itself be very interesting. These models are based on gas map, so the main sources of background gamma ray emission in, in this energy range are coming from cosmic ray protons scattering on the gas, producing pinots, which subsequently decay into photons, or from high energy, or from cosmic ray electrons, upscattering the photons of the interstellar radiation field to gamma ray energies. So the background models are based on the gas maps of the Milky Way, and then models for the cosmic ray distribution and the interstellar radiation field. Okay. Now, none of these things are perfectly known. The gas maps are reasonably well known, but towards the galactic center, they're not as well known as everywhere else in the sky. Um, the, and, the, um, and the cosmic ray models fit the data reasonably well, but they are models. 
you know, we, we can't directly measure the cosmic ray spectrum in these regions except by looking at the gamma rays. And so often what we do is use spatial models for the backgrounds but allow the spectrum, but allow their spectra to float pretty freely in these regions. So, so, yeah, so the fact that we see a difference between the model and the data would not in itself be at all surprising. We see differences between the model and the data in a lot of places. It's the particular features of this difference between the model and the data that make you think that there is actually something physical going on here, which I'll show you next slide. So to what extent is the uh, process rate model being calibrated? I mean, you could, say, assume the ratio of electrons to photons is universal, and then compare with synchrotron maps, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, although with it, yeah, so you can, so we have tried previously just kind of using synchrotron maps as a, almost as a proxy for the ICS. The trouble with synchrotron maps, of course, is we don't really know the magnetic fields in this region very well either. So, I like, yeah, I mean, so the, the synchrotron maps are a possible input, and we have used them previously as sort of a rough proxy for the distribution of electrons, but the magnetic fields in that region aren't that well known, and I don't think it's a safe assumption to say that they're uniform, to say that they're spatially uniform. So, right. so, yeah, no, that's, so this is, this is a really good point. Just because you see a difference between the model and the background doesn't necessarily mean there's something interesting here. What does tell you that maybe there's something interesting here? Let me, let me first just show you what the, what the XS looks like. So this panel on the left is zooming in on the galactic center region. So this is plus or minus 5 degrees in regions around the galactic center. This left panel is what it looks like before you subtract the background model. The right panel is what is left over once you subtract the background model. The color bar scales on these two panels are different by a factor of 3, which is why. So this plot in the center is not actually 100% of the emission around the center on this side. It's about a third of the emission. On that side. This, so in this plot, it looks like the excess extends less than a degree away from the galactic center, and then it just fades into this zero emission. That is that is kind of an artifact of the color bar in this case, and an artifact of the fact that the excess does appear to rise very steeply towards the galactic center. If you do the same exercise, but now we're looking at plus or minus 20 degrees around the galactic center, you cut out the galactic plane, you cut out point sources, around this galactic center, so this is, the, this is what's left over, the residual of data minus model in four different, in four different energy bands. And this sort of extended, so the mass size changes with energy band just because the, energy res, the angular resolution of Fermi is changing as you go up in energy. And this sort of green fuzzy blob around the center that you can see in this plot extends out to five degrees is the excess that we're talking about. And actually, if you do the analysis more carefully, the lower limit, the 95% lower limit on this extension is about 10 degrees. It's just hard to see in this plot because, again, the color bar. So, here are some properties of the excess. I'm not justifying them very much at this point. I'll do that in the next one. When you analyze this excess, you, you can ask, all right, what provides a bet you can... So what we're doing here is typically a template fit. We're modeling the background as a linear combination of various templates. We then put in some template for the signal and ask what is the significance with which it is preferred. We can try different variations on this template. We can try signal models which trace the galactic disk. We can try signal models that are just purely spherically symmetric. We can try signal models that are elongated in some arbitrary direction. And generally, we find that there may be a little bit of a preference for a stretch along the axis which is not the galactic disk. You can actually see that by eye here. But, um, this excess that we're seeing doesn't seem to be aligned with the galactic disk or elongated along the galactic disk at all. And within the uncertainties, it actually looks spherically symmetric. If you look in the galactic center, you can say that this appears, you can say again pretty precisely that this excess appears to be centered on Sagittarius A star, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. When all we had were these plots, I actually thought the most likely explanation was that some was that we were mismodeling the gamma ray emission associated with the black hole. But it turns out that the excess emission actually does extend out to 10 degrees from the galactic center, at which point it's much harder to explain. It's just saying that it could be associated with the black hole. The angular resolution of Fermi is between 0.1 and 1 degree. It rises very steeply towards the center. If you assume that this is a spherically symmetric source of gamma ray emission that we are seeing in projection, then the luminosity per unit volume would scale roughly as r to the minus 2.2 minus 2.8. That would occur, if this was a dark matter annihilation signal, that would correspond to dark matter density rising as r to the minus 1.1 to 1.4, because the signal would scale as density squared. So it's it's quite steep. But okay, but 
getting back to why should I believe this isn't just, well, maybe my background model is bad here. If you, so this was a, so this, these plots are taken from a paper by Colorado Hollis and Wenega in 2014. So here what they did was they broke up the signal, they looked at the signal in a bunch of different regions around the galactic center. They were always masking the galactic plane of plus or minus two degrees. They were looking outside the plane. So they looked in these regions north and south, the plane, one and two. They looked in regions three and four, five and six, seven and eight. Um, and I think this, I think that should be a nine, not an eleven, nine, ten. And in each of these regions, they tried to do a systematic, they tried to do an estimate for the systematic uncertainty on the excess based on looking at other regions in the sky, looking at how badly, looking at the discrepancies between the data and the model in other regions, and using that to build up sort of a space of the reasonable systematic uncertainties on this signal. That is what allows, so these yellow bands are the systematic uncertainty bands that they get from that exercise. And so then these panels show the spectrum, so this is E squared D and E on the y-axis and energy on the x-axis. This shows the spectrum with systematic errors that they extracted from each of these regions. Now, so there are a couple of things that I want you to notice. So the main thing that I want you to notice here is that it looks like the spectrum that you extract for the excess is pretty consistent in all these regions. This is also consistent with what you extract if you look right at the galactic center. There's always this preference for a bump of 1 to 3 GE. As you move out to large radii, like, I mean, this 9 region is more than 15 degrees from the galactic center, there's not really significant evidence for anything much. This is why we can only say that it extends out to at least 10 degrees of high confidence. But the spectral shape, this peak around a couple of GB, is always consistent. And this spectral feature appears to be very symmetric as we move out from the galactic center. It really only depends on how far you are from the center. This is not what you would naively, this is not what you would expect if what was going on was simply that our very non-symmetric background model was mismodeling the very non-symmetric data. It is very peculiar that the difference between those two things would give you something that is, would give you by accident, something that appears spherically symmetric with a consistent spectrum everywhere. Okay. There are other arguments for why this uh, probably isn't just a problem with the diffuse model. The, this paper also tried 60 different variations on the diffuse model, uh, trying uh, essentially changing the modeling of the cosmic rays, and found that the well, you may be able to see these blue dotted bands here. That's the full envelope of the results in all the models that they tried. And they included models that actually don't fit other data for the galaxy, just to see the effects of ju just to see the effects of pushing some of these assumptions into extreme regions. Well, for example, how much play was given to the spectral index of the cosmic rays? The spe so it could have been much harder in this yeah. one region. So, so what? So what we actually? So what we did and what these guys did following us was actually to not. Um, so, so what we did was fit it, was perform the template fit independently in every energy band, allowing the spatial templates to float independently in each energy band. Now, so this still has an assumption on the spectrum in the sense that it's assuming that the, the model has the spatial variation of the spectrum approximately right. Okay, so like if, if the model has a uni if the model for one particular planet has a uniform spectrum everywhere, then Splitting this up into different energy bands will still force the spectrum to be the same everywhere. But the spectrum can be whatever it wants. And then we compared the spectrum that we recovered for the background models to what would have been predicted from the cosmic ray spectrum that we're putting in and tested self consistency. And we do get something that is consistent. Okay, so, so we're, we're, we're actually giving our background templates freedom to have whatever arbitrary spectrum they would like. But in background templates where we combine multiple different um, multiple different components. But your background templates are being calibrated over a wider angular, angular range than the one which you find in the excess. Uh, yes, generally. Yeah. So, so you, you can test be. yeah, so you can test the effect of changing the region over which you fit the over which you fit the um, background models. That that does have that does have an impact. It doesn't change any of the qualitative things that I've told you. What you find is that if you fit over the whole sky, 
then you actually do tend to systematically mismodel the inner galaxy along the plane in that the background model is actually brighter than the data all along the plane. So then you get over subtraction along the plane, and what happens is that in regions very close to the plane, you still see this bump-like feature, but it's like it's sitting on a negative offset. So you, you always still see the feature. Um, but, but if you do this without thinking about it, and then you just ask, is this excess spherical or not, then you can get, then you can return that it says, oh, it looks like it's actually elongated perpendicular to the plane. Well, I said chalk. But, uh, but, but, but if you actually look at what the spectra look like, then if you fit over a fairly small region, then what you find is sort of spectrum away from the plane looks like this, spectrum along the plane looks like this, they look very similar. If you fit over too large a region, you get this over subtraction along the plane, and then the spectrum that you extract for the excess look kind of like this. So I mean, it's pretty clear that what's going on here is that there is a generic over subtraction. So it, it can change like subtleties of the excess, like do you, do you prefer a stretch a bit off the plane? We have not been, we've tried quite a few things here, changing the point source modeling, changing the masking, changing the regions over which we fit, fitting only in the north, fitting only in the south, things that should affect, that should, if the diffuse background modeling was having a major influence, then these should change the answer. And we have not been able to do anything which makes the excess prefer a stretch along the plane or which significantly changes the spectrum from this. So, I mean, I, I, I do still worry about these things, but we haven't yet been able to find any change like this that we can do that makes this go away. Okay, so like I said, I'm very happy to talk more about this afterwards because I can and have given my whole hour seminars on, on these issues. But let me move on to, um, let me move on a little bit. All right, so what are the hypotheses for what this could be? Well, one of them is dark matter annihilation. This is the one that makes particle physicists and probably cosmologists very, very excited. That what we might be seeing here are the first signal of um, interactions between dark matter and the standard model. Um, the other class of hypotheses is what particle physicists tend to call conventional astrophysics, by which they mean simply that it doesn't require new physics beyond the standard model. So the two leading sort of classes of explanations that people have talked about is some population of stars and other point sources with a spherically symmetric distribution about the galactic center rising steeply towards the galactic center. The most discussed candidate for this is the population of early second pulsars. The other possibility is that this is some kind of new diffuse background, the signature of some outflow or burst from the galactic center that our existing models are just not capturing properly. So I said in my title, dark matter or point sources, the answer might be no, it might be something else that we're not thinking about. This would be less exciting for particle physicists among us, but it would, if we could find something really new, it could tell us something, some pretty interesting things about the galactic center region. So we just sort of go through the arguments in favor and against these arguments prior to our latest work. What favors the dark matter explanation is, it's pretty easy. So this is a plot of the spectrum from our paper at the beginning of last year, before the Calori paper. It's pretty easy to get a bump-like spectrum like this with dark matter. You need the dark matter to be pretty light, it needs to be about 100 GeV or less. It could annihilate to a fairly wide range of standard model particles and have a bump feature like this. Dark matter naturally explains why the spectrum looks the same everywhere and why the signal looks pretty symmetric. Because the spectrum here is just purely being set by dark matter interactions with the standard model, those are the same everywhere. Um, the symmetry could just be an effect of the fact, well, we know that dark matter isn't clumped into a disk, like the baronets. The signal size, I told you earlier that um, if you have a cross section of 2 or 3 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second, then we can explain how much dark matter there is in the universe. This line going through the data points corresponds to a cross section of 2 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second for 50 GeV dark matter annihilating primarily the weak blocks. Since this paper came out, there's been a ton of activity in the literature. It's a, this is actually a pretty straightforward kind of dark matter model for right now. The profile rises steeply towards the galactic center, so it looks like the ordinary NFW profile, just a little bit steeper. Power loss looks at 1.1 to 1.4 instead of 1.0. This is, as I said, we don't really know what the dark matter density is towards the center of the Milky Way, but this is certainly within the range of things that people would have considered reasonable. And yeah, the fact that the spectrum is the same everywhere is easy to explain with dark matter annihilation. So, what about the millisecond pulsar explanation? So, the advantage. Uh, just yeah? So, um, the uh, index 1.4, yeah. um, you 
said. Well, it's one point, I said 1.1 1 .1 to 1.4. Right. Yeah. Um, but one does expect that there's a certain amount of flattening that will occur, even though you might not have seen the statistics yet. So I wonder if that so would be uh, kind of I, I would really love to have better. So, right. Um, so the issue here, yeah. So, so there are there are so many simulations recently that show that baryonic physics can flatten out the center of of halos. Um, my <coughs> understanding is that it's hard to say. I mean, I, I would really love to be wrong about this. I would really love to have better information on this. But my understanding is that it's hard to say we can definitely exclude a dark matter profile that is a fairly steep path. That is a power loss well, one. Well, I think that's true. The the, uh, and, and, and you're absolutely right that the baryon is going to push things in one of two directions. Right. You can either e either they can cause adiabatic contraction in the profile, right. which makes so, it steeper, so or the adiabatic contraction. I was thinking of in terms of the uh, the the Actually, adiabatic so contraction makes it steeper. It will do some. Uh, like the, that, it would be following the that it would be related to the, that if it's steeper than NFW, then that something about its shape should be related to the potential. Yeah, um, I think that's I think that's a really interesting question, and if we could have a solid if we could have a prediction for this of like a correlation between the shape of the halo and the slope, that would be really interesting to me. Um, but if it's out there, I'm not aware of it. Uh, if I just missed it, then please let me know because that would be great. Well, well the related question, of course, is. Say the signal size matches what you would set yeah. from a relic, right. but does that allow for any enhancement of the dark matter density? Because that so right, so so, it, so, right. so here, so here, right, so here, what we're doing is because we can measure the s signal from the center of the galaxy up to about ten degrees, we can get a right. right. So this is a really good question. So we're essentially so where we have a measurement of the dark matter density that we sort of trust is around the solar circle. Uh, we can only see this excess out to 1.5 kpc from the center. So we are performing in a, so within 1.5 kpc of the center, we can measure what the slope is. But we're essentially extrapolating based on an NFW profile from 1.5 kpc out to the solar circle. So yeah, when I say like it matches the rate, the fact that we got exactly two times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second for our best spin, like that's a coincidence. I mean, the error bars on the cross section that you need to make this are certainly at least a factor of two. But but because because there is that extrapolation from 1.5 kpc to 8 kpc in which we can't measure the signal, we're just extrapolating. But um, but I mean, but the fact that I mean, it didn't need it didn't need to be anywhere in the right ballpark, and it is. All right. But so so those are arguments in favor of the dark matter interpretation. Arguments in favor of the millisecond pulsar interpretation. Well, the strong the strongest argument in favor of it is that if you look at the spectrum of observed millisecond pulsars in gamma rays. That at energies above 1 GeV, they actually line up very closely with what we see from the excess. From about this point onwards, if I were to overplot the average pulsar spectrum, it looks like this. So, I mean, that's a strong argument. Because we could not have made and predicted that dark matter, that, that spectrum, just from the statement that it was coming from dark matter annihilation. There's also been an argument that millisecond pulsars typically come from binary systems, where an old pulsar is spun back up by a companion. That could naturally explain why the profile is so steep. And there are measurements of X-ray binaries in Andromeda that suggest that you could have this sort of steep power loss slope extending out to about 1.5 kpc from the center, which is the equivalent of 10 degrees from the center of our galaxy, i.e. to where the signal is. The arguments against it are essentially that if, we, if you look at models for the MSP distribution or observations of MSPs in our galaxy, they don't appear to be distributed. They, they, they're distributed like a disk. And if you extrapolate those models into the region where we would see a signal, then they don't give rise to the right shape, and they don't produce enough flux. Do we know anything about um, an effective age distribution? I mean, there could be an age. Right. Yeah. So, so, the, so right. So people would say, well, OK, but you, know, you have the bulge there. You have the galactic center. I mean, the stars in the bulge are older. So maybe we have a different, maybe we have a different distribution of MSPs. Again, this is one of these topics that I'm happy to talk about more. And, and this is actually currently my linear explanation, I should say, so I don't want to argue against it too strongly. But um, the, so there are two things that you can do. You can say, all right, how many bright pulsars? So 
you can say, okay, this signal would be coming from a lot of faint pulsars because it looks like diffuse emission. So we can try to calibrate how many faint pulsars we expect to see in a couple of ways. We could look at the number of X-ray binaries compared to the number of faint pulsars in other systems that have both, and then look at the number of bright X-ray binaries in this region. Or we could look at the number of bright pulsars in other systems, with, in, in other regions that are close enough to us that we can see both the bright pulsars and the fainter ones. And we can say, well, okay, if we had the same luminosity function, how many bright pulsars would we have seen in the inner galaxy if we had enough faint pulsars to generate this signal? This is under some dispute in the literature, but there does seem to be some evidence that if this population of pulsars were to explain the excess, then its luminosity function would need to cut off at a point that is somewhat lower than what we see elsewhere in the galaxy. So you would need to have more faint pulsars relative to bright ones. You would also need to have more faint pulsars relative to X-ray binaries than we see in globular clusters, for example. So when people have tried to do calibrations based on other populations, it doesn't really seem to work. But perhaps that just means that this is a systematically different population. But that in turn means that the other populations we've seen may not give us much guidance as to the properties of this population. So that's the MSP situation. So what about the other possibility I mentioned? What if you have some outburst from the galactic center that produces some high energy cosmic rays and as these stream outlets, they scatter on the gas or on the satellite and produce a signal? I don't think this is the answer, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. The advantage of this explanation is that there have certainly been supernova outbursts in the galactic center in the past. There's, the black hole has probably been active at some time in the past. Some kind of outflow like this is physically reasonable. We see structures like the Fermi bubbles, which may have originated from something like this. The arguments against it are that excess is really spherically symmetric, and it doesn't appear to be correlated with the gas at all. So if you had some stream of protons coming out of the galactic center and scattering on the gas, it's hard to understand why they would make a signal that doesn't look at all like the gas. If you have electrons interacting with satellite, the problem is that electrons lose their energy as they propagate outwards. So you would not naively expect the spectrum of emission right at the galactic center to be said the same as the spectrum of the emission in kilopasic away from the galactic center. So this could be the answer, but those arguments that those uh, two issues argue against it for me. But, okay, so for the rest of this talk, I wanted to, so that was the standard, this is an extended version of this is the talk that I would have given on this axis at the start of this year. So, since, so now I'm going to tell you about the most recent thing that we did. It's important to study the theoretical plausibility of models to ask, you know, is there some dark matter model that could make this excess? Could we possibly have an outflow that could match all the features of the excess? Could we have an MSP population or a pulsar population that could generate the excess? But it can be really hard to assess. There are a lot of unknowns in many of these problems. So what can we learn just by looking back at the data? So in particular, what we hoped to be able to do was to be able to distinguish relatively smooth diffuse emission from a population of point sources by looking at the spatial distribution of photons. So this is kind of a cartoon if we had a smooth a uh, signal from dark matter annihilation or from some diffuse emission, some diffuse emission mechanism that just rose smoothly towards the center of the galaxy. You might see a signal that looked like this, just Poisson noise from this distribution. Whereas if what you were looking at was a population of a not too large number of point sources, then you would see many more bright spots where there's a point source and also many more cold spots where there is just no emission in the gaps between sources. Of course, there's a limiting case if you have an infinite number of infinitely faint point sources, that's also known as diffuse emission. But, but we are hoping that there might be some region in between where we could tell these two apart. So the approach that we take generally to extract the excess has always been we model the photon counts as some linear combination of templates. So these are, these are background templates in the simplest analysis we do. We do more complex ones as well. One is just some diffuse model. So this comes, as I said, from gas maps and cosmic ray models. So this is for this is diffuse emission from cosmic rays hitting the gas or the starlight. We put in an ad hoc template for so this is a template for the Fermi bubbles. These are these large gamma ray structures that my collaborators and I discovered in 2010. Um, like I said, in the simplest analysis we do, we just treat these to be constant. Um, we just treat these to be constant within their boundaries. They turn out to be a pretty small contributor to the total emission, so it doesn't matter very much how you treat them. 
and we allow just an isotopic, and we allow just an isotopic background. Now, in addition to this, we could add signal templates. We could add a signal template which has the spatial distribution of an NFW profile squared. We could add a signal template which looks like some model for the stars in the bulge, and so forth. So, our model then is just a set of coefficients for each of these templates. So, the templates depend on which pixel you're in and which template it is. Coefficients are pixel independent. They it just depends on the template. So then, given this model, and given the data, we can write down a Poisson likelihood in each pixel, probability of seeing the observed number of counts, given the model. And then we can, so we compute the, pixel, the Poisson pixel likelihood, and then the overall likelihood is given by the product of the Poisson likelihoods for each pixel, and then we, maximize, we can maximize our, our likelihood with respect to these parameters and compare maximum likelihoods. We can also do evasion analysis, put in priors, and then compute the posterior probabilities distributions for each of these parameters. So this is what we normally do. And the way that we normally handle point sources is we either just put them into the model as an additional template, or we, um, or, or we mask them out. We cut them out of our fitting region. So what about point sources? Well, so that's how we deal with known sources. But how would we deal with the population of unknown sources? So our answer is to, so where we don't know where they are. We have a suspicion, like we have a model for some population of unknown sources. We know their overall distribution, but we don't know the draw from that distribution, where each source happened to be. So, in that case, you can treat these sources in your model as a source of non Poissonian statistics. So, this method was worked out by Nala Shevin Hogg in 2011. Leela Santi and Safti showed how to talk about it in the specific context of the Fermi data in 2014. So, what's that basic idea here? So let's suppose, let's just do a toy example. Suppose I have my model, a model which predicts 10 photons per pixel in some regions of the sky. And I want to know what's my probability of finding 10 photons. Say, you know, it's Poissonian statistics, expect 10 photons per pixel. My probability of finding 12 photons is about 0.1. It's it's a it's an order, you know, it's an order one number. It's not unusual. My probability of finding zero photons is quite small. You need to plot your way down a fair way to get to zero photons when you expected 10. It's not totally negligible to be times 10 to the minus 1. My probability of seeing 100 photons when I expected 10 is pretty much zero. But now, let's suppose, so, and I just use Poisson statistics for this. But now let's suppose that my expected number of 10 photons per pixel actually represents that what I know is there is some population of rare sources. And from each source, I would expect 100 photons, but 9 out of 10 pixels have no sources in them. Okay? My probability of finding a source in a given pixel is 0.1. So the expected mean number of photons is still the same in this situation. It's still, on average, I expect 10 photons per pixel. But now, my probability of finding zero photons is really high. It's, I mean, it's 90%, but that's just the probability that there were no sources in this pixel. I'm simplifying here and not including the fact that I could have multiple sources in one pixel. So I have either zero or one. So my probability of seeing um, 12 photons in one pixel is now really tiny, because to see a non-zero number of photons, I would need there to be a source in that pixel. But then I would need that source to fluctuate down to giving me 12 photons when I expected 100. So my probability of seeing 12 photons is like 10 to the minus 30. Whereas my probability of seeing 100 photons, well, I just need to have a source. I have my 10% chance of getting a source in that pixel. And then what's the probability that I saw exactly as many photons as I expect? This is a few times 10 to the minus 3. So you see that here, we can distinguish between the case of the diffuse emission and the case of a population of rare sources, basically by asking, what is my probability to see a small number of photons versus a medium number of photons versus a large number of photons? The case with sources gives me many more pixels where you see nothing but also many more pixels where you see just a bunch of photons together. Another way to say this is the statistics in Poissonian, because if I know I'm looking at a bunch of sources, then once I see a photon from a pixel, um, it changes my probability of seeing a subsequent photon from that pixel. Because as soon as I see the first photon, I know there's a source there. So the events aren't independent. What is the accuracy of determining where the photon came from? Uh, like the angular resolution of Fermi? It's between about 0.1 and 1 degrees, depending on energy. And so, we're, so as I'll show you for this analysis, we go to quite, we go to fairly high energies. We look at a two to twelve GeV energy range, 
because there the angular resolution is about 0.2 degrees. So we're just trying to capture as much of the bump as we can while also staying in the region of good angular resolution. Okay, so, so essentially, so we can model a population of rare sources just by putting down a spatial template that describes their overall distribution, but allowing them to have non Poissonian statistics. So we can work out, so this is, this is a slide full of math, but um, so the way that these statistics are set up is easiest if you recast the probability of seeing a certain number of events given a model in terms of generating functions, just because if you have a number of independent components, then the generating function, the, so the generating function is defined in this way, the probability is given by derivatives of the generating functions. There's a theorem that says that the total generating function for the sum of independent model components is just given by the product of the components. So this allows you to have a model which includes both diffuse components, with smooth components, and populations of new sources. The generating function for a point source population is given by this result, by this formula, where xm is the expected number of sources that produce m photons. So, and that's just determined, so, okay, so what do you need to put into this model to characterize your source population? You need to know what is your distribution of sources with a given number, that produce a given number of expected photons. So in the toy example I did, this was just like a delta function at 100 photons. I only had sources that produced 100 photons each, but of course, more generally, this will be some distribution. So then we need to integrate over that, so then we need to do a Poisson draw from that distribution to work out how many photons we should actually be seeing. And so the expected number of sources that actually produce a given number of photons. So this is what this convolution is doing. This is a Poisson draw. This function rho of f is accounting for the fact that our angular resolution isn't perfect, that you may have a point source in one pixel that gets spread out into neighboring pixels. So this is this is a this is a spherical function, essentially. So fs is the number of um, actual predicted photons in the source. If it's just a rescaling factor for the fact that you're going to lose some of them to neighboring pieces. Okay, so so we're now just going to redo our likelihood analysis exactly as before, except that now some of our templates, instead of having a Poisson likelihood, have a non-Poisson. The likelihood is computed using these non-Poissonian statistics. So that means that these additional new point source templates have extra parameters associated with this source count function. So in our baseline analysis. We just model the source count function as a broken power law. Well, we do generalizations of this later. The baseline we model is a broken power law, so there are three new parameters here, which is the um, the break, the position of the break, so the number of photons at which the power law changes, the power law above the break, and the power law below the break. Now, just as previously, we can still have spatial templates for these point source populations, which describe the overall distribution of point sources. So you might say, you know, at, at the galactic center, my chance of finding one of these sources is much higher than 20 degrees away from the galactic center. So do you assume uh, sort of a mean profile on which you uh, impose the Poissonian? Yeah, so, so what we, so because our, the question, where the question that we want to answer is which one explains the data better, a smooth template or a point source like template, then we make the overall distribution the same in both cases. So is it slave to the dark matter? So it's so when we were doing this comparison, um, it was slave to the dark. Like the, the spatial templates were not allowed to float here for both the dark matter and the point sources. We picked a template that in previous studies had been found to describe the XS well. We use the same one. Okay. Uh, did you do any testing because uh, the expectation is right. So. Yeah, so I mean, the point there is, I mean, it's not so much the point source are being slaved to the dark matter, it's both of them are being slaved to something that matches the overall distribution of the excess, because we were trying to ask which one of them explains the excess better. We have done tests where we have point source templates which have a different distribution to, to the dark matter templates. I'll show you those. But let me show you some results first. All right, so the first thing that we did was actually had nothing to do with the inner galaxy. We just wanted to check our code and check that the method was working and making sense. So we looked at high galactic latitudes. We cut out everything within 30 degrees of the galactic plane. A, a similar method had been used before in the Malachem and Hong paper, looking at high latitudes, and there have been other studies of the isotropic gamma ray background, which um, use somewhat different methods, but we're trying to get at the same question, which was um, in the 
in the high latitude emission, how much of that emission it appears to be coming from unresolved point sources. So here we have the simple background model that I showed you earlier, diffuse emission, bubbles, isotropic background, and we added an isotropic point source template. So this is just an isotropic template. The reason why it doesn't look the same everywhere is because this is being convolved with the Fermi instrument response functions. This is being convolved with Fermi's exposure. Um, and we're just allowing this template to now have non poissonian statistics. So it has four extra degrees of freedom, which are overall normalization, the break in the source count function, and the power laws above and below the source count function. So from that, we can make plots like this. So these, so this plot is showing, so DNDF, so this is the, um, so this is like the source count function, DNDS, except we're using flux in photons per square centimeter per second per seridian instead of the total number of photons. Sorry. F is photons per square centimeter per second per, per square degree in this case, I guess. So this is the source count function after rescaling factors. So the we do two types of analysis here. One is you in one, we don't mask out any of the known point sources. We just leave all the known point sources in the analysis. We don't put in any model for them, and we see if our isotopic point source template will pick up the known you know, will recover the known point sources. That's the green line. So the green line, so the green, this green region, so the green region shows the posterior probability distribution for the source count function associated with isotropic point sources when we do not mask out any of the known sources. The black points show the histogram of DNDF versus F for the known, for the known sources in the 3F geom. So as you would expect, when we do this, then we find a source count function that agrees very well with the known sources. Our template that was supposed to pick up point sources is successfully picking up the known high latitude point sources. Okay, so like that's good, um, but, it, but, it's, but it's kind of an easy test. I mean, some of these sources are 20 sigma. It's, it shouldn't be hard to find them. So then, in this case, we did an exercise where we masked out, we cut out all the known point sources, just masked them out of the analysis. We didn't try to model them, we just removed the region around them, and then we rerun the analysis. So now what we're getting is the source count function of the unresolved point sources. And we recovered, and, that, and that's given by this orange band. So the fact that this orange band starts to cut off here, we've sculpted that. Like by the fact that we a posteriori removed from our data set all the bright point sources. So now our source count function can't predict sources that Fermi would have seen because we've already cut out, we've already masked out all those sources. So there has to be a downturn here. So this isn't this is visible. This is, this is a cutoff sculpted by our method. But you can see that these low fluxes, where Fermi sees very few sources and has very little sensitivity, we actually recover the shape that you would have gotten just by extrapolating down the power law source count function from the known sources. We recover that with no information about the known sources. So, this gives us some confidence that this method is working. We put, this analysis finds that about half of the isotropic gamma ray background is due to the resolved and unresolved sources. About half of that is coming from known resolved sources. About half of that is coming from the remaining unresolved ones. And that agrees with what other papers in the literature have estimated. Did this fit with just a diffuse template? Did you get like, a different result? Like, did you not recover the point sources? Uh, like, if, if, we just, if we just fit it with a diffuse template and no non Poissonian? template. Uh, so the diffuse template would probably um, have a higher normalization as it would soak up a fair amount of the emission from the unresolved sources. Um, I mean it wouldn't soak up it wouldn't soak up all the emission. But I mean obviously if we had no non quasodian template there would be no point in talking about a source count function recovered from that effort yet. So I mean, but, but yeah probably the diffuse emission would soak up almost all the emission from the unresolved sources and some of the emission from the non sources. Okay. So now the intergalaxy analysis. So now we looked in a region within 30 degrees of the center. Again, we're going to do masked and unmasked analyses. When we masked the known point sources, we masked pretty aggressively. These are about one degree radius masks. The annual resolution of Fermi of this energy, of the minimum energy in our beam is about 0.2 degrees. So um, this is an aggressive mask. That's how the space. So now we're adding two more templates to the fit, one of which, so again, as I said, both of these have been chosen to 
try to describe the excess pretty well. So one of these is the smooth dark matter motivated model that gave the best fit to the excess in previous studies. The other one has exactly the same overall distribution, just because we don't want this to be a degree of freedom at this stage, but it has the ability to have non-Poissonian statistics. And we're going to do um, we're going to do a, we're going to do a Bayesian analysis, work out the posterior probability distributions, and compute the Bayesian evidence, which should be capable of taking into account the fact that this template has three extra degrees of freedom relative to this template, and so it should be disfavored. Uh, and so it should get a penalty, so it's being more complicated. Okay, so I'm going to refer to this template as NFW, and this template as NFWPS, where PS means one sources. Okay, so, at the, so here, are, here are the results we get. So this is the, okay, so let me first look at these inset plots. So these are posterior probability distributions for the flux associated with this template as a fraction of the total flux within 10 degrees from the center, but masking out the galactic plane. So this is the unmasked case, where we don't mask or model any of the known sources. The dark matter template, key, so and the insets are the case where we haven't put in a dark matter shaped point source template. We haven't put in a point source template shaped like the excess, so we expect the dark matter template to pick up all the power associated with the excess. So the posterior probability distribution for the flux fraction associated with that dark matter template is this red, uh, is this red peak, and it peaks at about seven percent of the total emission in this region. This is for the masked analysis, it peaks at about five percent. The difference between these is partly that the dark matter template is probably um, picking up some of the points, some of the emission from the point sources. Um, it's also partly that our, our masking is actually aggressive enough that it changes um, it changes the way that the other templates behave slightly. In the field. Like we're cutting out enough solid angle that it um, that, that it that it that it modifies the that it that it modifies the. But, okay, so but basically 5 to 7% of this excess, if you don't put in any point source template, is attributed to the dark matter template. And that's consistent with what other people have found for the excess. Over this region, it's about 5 to 7% of the emission. So then these plots show what happens to the posterior distributions once you add in the NFWPS template. So again, now the red is the posterior probability distribution for the flux associated with the smooth dark matter-like template, and blue is the posterior probability distribution associated with the point source, with the, te with the template that is shaped like the excess overall, but has point source-like statistics. So in the case where, um, so in both cases, if there's one punch lag or the talk is the punch lag, in both cases, the posterior probability distribution of flux associated with the dark matter is peaked at zero, and go to pulled off to zero well before explaining the whole flux associated with the excess. The blue, the point source template, so in the case where we don't mask the point sources, it picks up about 12 or 13% of the excess in total, so it's picking up, so of the emission in total, so it's picking up the whole excess plus an additional contribution from the, probably from the known sources. Where, and in the mask case, previously the dark matter template picked up 5%, now the point source template picks up five percent. So it just the fit prefers the entire excess to be assigned to the point source template. So okay, so we can now we can now plot the source count function for this reconstructed. Um, we can plot the source count function, and so again, green is the unmasked case, orange is the masked case. These points show the histogram of known sources. So what we find then is, so what we find is that it appears that there's a feature, so a Fermi sensitive point source sensitivity is about here. You can see this is where the number of point sources they detect starts to drop off pretty sharply. So what we find is actually, what we would infer from this source count function is actually a feature in the source count function, not far below Fermi's current sensitivity. Low flux end prefers quite a flat source count function. Now, as I said previously, from this plot, this cutoff, um, you can't say that this cutoff is physical. This cutoff could just be sculpted by the fact that we mask all the sources above that cutoff. I'll show you on the next slide, there's actually an argument that it's, um, that it's physical. But because the source count function is so flat at this low end, the prediction 
The prediction has very large uncertainties, but we would infer that the excess in this region can be explained by about 200 point sources, which means for the excess as a whole, you would need order of a thousand sources. And half the flux would be coming from just this bright end of the luminosity function from 60 currently undetected point sources. Now, so this is, so we were a little surprised by this statement that there appears to be a feature in the source count function right below Fermi's current sensitivity. And so we wanted to try to um, do an analysis which didn't rely on us masking out all the high-end point sources, but which still had some ability to pick up the known point sources. So here we added another, we didn't mask any of the known sources, but we added a disk-shaped template inspired by models of pulsars in the Milky Way. And we just threw this into the pit. So now we're not masking any of the known sources, we're not effectively telling the pit where Fermi's sensitivity is. What we found in this blue line is the source count function associated with this disk-like template, um, which essentially picks up all the known sources and has this and has this fairly steep slope. The green line shows the green region shows the source count function associated with the template shaped like the excess. So even though, though now we're not giving the fit any information about you know you should not predict point sources above a certain cutoff, it still prefers this hard slope and then a very abrupt cutoff. So this is at least tentative evidence for the excess being associated with some novel population of sources whose luminosity function cuts off not very far below Fermi's current detection threshold. Okay, now I realize that I, it's an hour since I started, so I will, so I will go through this bit fairly quickly and leave more details for questions. We do a model comparison looking at the ratio of Bayesian evidences for the models with and without including NFWPS, for those of you who do a lot of patient statistics, I'm happy to talk about the prize and so on later. We find that the uh, non-zero NFWPS contribution is preferred with a base factor of 10 to the 7, which is quite strong evidence. If you were to take, we, we have also computed the likelihoods. Um, since I looked at this slide, the likelihood ratio is a bit larger than the, than the base factor. Not, not a lot larger. I mean, you should you can think roughly of the base factor as being like a likelihood ratio, but with a penalty for the extra degrees of freedom, the extra volume of the space. So if we were to try to convert this to a test statistic to delta log likelihood, it would be about 30. If you were to assume everything was Gaussian, which is not an assumption that you should necessarily make, and do a very rough conversion of the number of sigma, this would be about five sigma, or equivalent, or you know, or more simply, same kind of very rough estimate. If we were to say, well, the base factor is 10 to the 7, 1 times 10 to the minus 7 confidence level corresponds to about 5 sigma. So what drives this preference for point sources? You can, um, so as I said earlier, what's really driving this is basically in the presence of point sources, you expect more hot pixels and more cold pixels. So you can look at the number of pixels which are much brighter than you would expect given, the, given a Poissonian background model and look at how many such outliers there are and compare that to the Poisson distribution. So this plot shows the, so epsilon is a measure of how unlikely the pixels are, small epsilon means very unlikely. The blue is the model with no point sources in it. Green is a model including our best fit point source template. This is just showing the number of very, unlike, very bright pixels and the red points of the data. So this is really what's driving the preference that the data has a lot more hot spots in it. Than you would have naively, than you would have expected from the purely diffuse model. And this is a picture of where our hotspots are on the sky when we don't mask anything. The circles are the locations of known sources. The bright, the color shows how unlikely these pixels are relative to a purely diffuse background model. So you can see we are finding, like, we are finding most of the known sources. There is a lot of overlap between these circles and our pixels that are very unlikely. But we do have hot pixels that are not associated with any of the known sources. Um, also the converse, which we can talk about more later. But, so we could go after those hot pixels as potential source candidates. So how robust is the analysis? We have checked a bunch of systematics. Um, we've looked into the impact, we've run this in mock data, checked that we've recovered consistent results when we run our method on mock data. 
We've looked at what happens if we change the signal model. We've looked at what happens if we try a range of different background models. We've looked at the effects of putting in the wrong, the wrong angular resolution, assuming that Fermi has a much significantly worse or better angular resolution than we think it really does. We've tried adding more freedom to the source count function, not fixing to this broken parallel model. We tried a simple look elsewhere test where we basically re-ran this analysis on a bright spot in the sky about 30 degrees along the plane from the galactic center. Then we don't find any preference for point sources. So our model is tested in the case that it's not that if we try this model on any place in the sky where there's a difference between the model and the data, then our method always returns a preference for point sources. That's not true. If we look at other, if we look away from the galactic center, we don't generally see this preference. We've tried just chopping the data set in half, looking at the northern hemisphere separately from the southern hemisphere. Everything looks consistent within the uncertainties. The original paper was based on five and a half years of Fermi data. We've updated it to the most recent Fermi data set. The base factor increases. The results all look consistent. So given the time, I'm just going to, again, very happy to talk more about those systematics and questions. But OK, if we take these best results at face value, what are we seeing? We have an evidence for a population that has the spectrum, peak to 1 to 3 GeV, that's sharply rising towards the galactic center, that's approximately spherically symmetric, and if we really take that source count function seriously, which should be taken with caution at the moment, it also suggests a characteristic luminosity scale of about 10 to the 34 Oaks per second in gamma ray luminosity above 1 GeV. Just to be clear, is there any difference in the spatial distribution of this, these unresolved point sources and non point, point sources? Yeah. So, so like, well, so it, it appears to be. I mean, like I said, when, when we put, when we throw down that disk template yes. for the sources, that picks up all the known point sources. Yes. It picks up almost nothing of the excess. The excess gets completely attributed to a point source population that has a fairly flat luminosity function that then falls like a rock. And a very just different, below the a sun very sun different angular distribution of the sky. Yeah. So these two templates, one of them, yeah, one of them looks like, one of them looks like this. And one of them looks like this. Yes, yes, yes. And all the known point sources get associated with this one, and the excess gets associated with this one. So it, it looks like there's some evidence for actually a different, a different population. So in terms of how hard this is to explain, the spectrum peak, well, if you're focusing on pulsars, that's mostly done for you. Sharply rising for the, towards the galactic center, well, if you're making these at the right at the galactic center somehow and having them move outwards, maybe that can be natural. If you have binary systems, maybe this can be natural. Spherical symmetry has generally been hard to get. And this is not something that people have really looked at, because before this paper, there was no reason to think that this was the case. So how hard is that to explain? So there have been a couple of papers trying to explain this signal with pulsar models. There was a study of young pulsars by this group. So the difficulty with this model is that if you look at their prediction, so here they have young pulsars being produced around the galactic center and moving outwards. The difficulty with this explanation is really that what they predict for the signal looks like this. I mean, there's a bright region at the galactic center, but the difference between here and here is only about you know, a factor of two or three, whereas from here to here is you know, the, the signal falls off much more rapidly. So you don't really predict a spherical signal in this case. There was an interesting paper in July this year which postulated disrupted globular clusters as a source of MSPs. The idea here was that globular clusters would spiral in towards the galactic center, tidal stripping of these clusters would spill millisecond pulsars and other objects into a shell around the galactic center, and because MSPs are very long-lived, then these could remain bright and gamma rays after all other traces of this process were gone. The distribution of known globular clusters is roughly spherical. So the resulting shell could also be spherical. And they, they took this method from a paper last year, Model for Dense Galactic Nuclei, and they say that without any free parameters, they predict roughly the right gamma ray luminosity and distribution. <coughs> so this is interesting. I'm not necessarily saying this is what's going on, but this is an interesting idea. So this modeling re reduce the ratio of implied um, Millisecond pulsar mass, just 
stellar mass. Yeah, so, so, so what they did was basically looked at, so the original world just had a prediction for stellar mass as a function of radius. What these guys did was look at formula clusters and said, okay, what's our ratio of gamma ray luminosity to stellar mass? Yeah. Assuming all the gamma rays are basically coming from MSPs, which probably isn't a bad assumption. Right. And then, and that allowed them to draw this blue line, and the data points here are measurements of the excess at different CI. <coughs> and so that's not, yeah, so that, that's their argument, that this allows you to reproduce the, both the amount of gamma rays. Gary, yeah, we had a fellow here until just uh, a year ago, I've got down made some fairly detailed uh, several nanometer models of formation of nuclear star clusters by tidal disruption of okay. water clusters. Okay. Um, Maybe we should talk about this after. Yeah. So let me, okay, so let me just tell you, so let me, well, I'm at my conclusions, basically. So the GV gamma ray excess is a striking potential clue to something, could be novel physics, could be novel astrophysics. Its detailed characterization has revealed several properties that are at least suggestive of dark matter annihilation. However, with adapted template fitting methods to this case of non Poissonian statistics and using them, we find what looks like a strong statistical preference for a novel unresolved point source population in the inner galaxy. If we can trust this method, then the source count function appears to be dominated by sources near Fermi's current detection threshold and with a flux sufficient to generate the entire observed GEV gamma ray excess. If such a population does exist, then there would be no residual preference for a non zero contribution to the GEV excess from dark matter annihilation that they basically all wants it to be entirely point sources. So if we can confirm the presence of such sources, it would solve this puzzle of the GVXS and also open up studies of what appears to be a novel gamma ray point source population in the inner galaxy. So thank you for listening. Sorry for going. So we've had a lot of questions, and I don't think we really should um, have more questions now. But we should all go right upstairs and have a great discussion over tea. We'll be taking uh, Tracy out for dinner tonight. Let me know if you're interested in coming. Everyone is welcome. Tracy's here tomorrow as well. Um, she'll be participating, I think, somewhat in the attending to the PI, seat at PI Day, but 